A big welcome to all of you PCC supporters today. My name is Cameron Witten. My pronouns are all of them. And I am a proud alum of Portland Community College. And I'm the CEO and founder of racial justice nonprofit Brown Hope and co-founder of the Black Resilience Fund. It is truly a privilege to be here with you all celebrating an anchor of our community that has helped all of us become stronger together. Hi everyone, my name is Charlene Love and my pronouns are she, her, or they, them. And I am a current PCC student and also an OHSU volunteer specializing in their transgender health program. In addition to that, I'm a community organizer, um, organizing events around transgender health throughout the city of Portland. And uh, just a little bit about myself, I am a transgender woman or transgender feminine person. I do consider myself non-binary. And I also live with disabilities. So my focus in my activist work is on improving uh, the health and lives of folks like me. And then in career uh, terms, my goal is to become a nurse practitioner. Uh, so thank you, thank you, Cameron, for doing this. And uh, thank you all for being here. I'm so excited. Charlie, it's exciting to meet you. Who's next? Hi, my name is Hannah Alsko. My pronouns are she, they. And I am currently working as the Next Up Youth Leadership Coordinator, but I'm actually a PCC alumni. And what I'm driven and what I'm passionate about is contributing to the collective liberation of folks globally. So whatever, I, whenever I have time to do that in my community, I spend my time doing that. Hina, I love it. Thank you so much for being here. And I am looking forward to this conversation. And last, but certainly not least. Cameron, it is a privilege to be here with you all today. My name is Eddie Bolaños and I am a PCC alum and I recently transferred to Linfield University where I will be completing my bachelor's degree. I am a social justice advocate uh, focusing on educational justice uh, and in the incorporation of ethnic studies programs across Oregon public schools and an immigrant rights activist. Eddie, so, so happy to have you here. And I just wanna pause for a minute and say, wow, um, you all share just a little tiny crumb of your life, but it was a crumb of inspiration. And I'm really looking forward to having this conversation with you all today. And so let us start off talking about change and social justice. We are living in such a challenging and unique time in this world. And social justice is critically important right now. So if all three of you could just talk for a moment about some cause or social justice issue that you are passionate about and are working on today. I'd love to answer that. So personally, what I'm working towards is, um, honestly, it is liberation, which I know is very broad, but it's really kind of seeking whatever means possible to, yeah, contribute to the collective liberation of folks globally that have been colonized. So that is kind of what I've been focused in on the most. And that's kind of something that's especially important to me um, living in the US as a Palestinian. It's kind of living in the heart of colonialism and imperialism globally. I feel like this is what I can do to help not only my people who have been colonized for hundreds of years, but also for all of the colonialism, for slavery, for the displacement, for the theft of land, because all of our struggles are interconnected. Henna, thank you so much for sharing. And I am so absolutely enamored by your talk about liberation and reminding us that liberation really is this encompassing experience that's not just about one issue but really about a mindset and a heart set and i'm wondering since you've brought up this term liberation could you actually take a moment and tell us what liberation means to you oh good question liberation liberation i think just means full autonomy which i know sounds like a very basic definition to that but i think in a world that's unfortunately been shaped by Western colonialism and imperialism. And at its core, really, it's just white supremacy. That is important to name in it. Um, that took away everyone's ability to live how we want. 
like in, in to, to live with full agency and autonomy to to live without this thinking of either it's a or b and that's why i want us it's not even necessarily a thing of a pre-colonial past it's that, that is our future and can be our future so liberation for me is just for us to be free from the shackles of white supremacy and that is going to be through a means of economic, but also much deeper than that of symbolically, ideologically. Um, it is things ingrained in us that they've talked about it would take over, I think over a thousand years to fully decolonize the world. But it is something that I want and I'm willing to fight for because I don't think it'll take that long when folks join together with that purpose. I mean, a, a future, a better future is possible. It is not impossible. If we want it, the closer we get to it, that is what it will be. That is utopia. It doesn't exist. We just have to fight for it. And that's the closest we'll be. Well, Hina, what I heard is a better future is possible. Thank you for that reminder. I'd love to hear next from Eddie. Hey. Hey, so, um, you know, there, there's a lot of uh, things going on around the country, uh, specifically with the new transition in the administration at the federal level. But I cannot continue my work in educational justice and immigrant justice without taking into account that Black lives are being lost day in and day out in this country. And it seems like it's a norm. As a person, knowing that there is an existing intersectionality with the Black Lives Matter movement and the work that I do encourages me to fight for Black Lives Matter as an ally, right? As an ally, because Black issues are immigrant issues, because Black issues are student issues, because Black issues are queer issues, and we cannot ignore it. We cannot go on with our quotidian lives without taking into account that black lives are being lost in the United States and people seem to not be doing anything. And so what I'm most passionately about and what I've been working on and collaborating with other organizers, many of whom are you yourselves, uh, is, is continuing to work with this, this long, long campaign of Black Lives Matter. Eddie, thank you so much. It is truly music to hear our allies who will speak out and loud that Black lives do matter. Thank you so much for your voice. Charlie, hey. Hi, Cameron. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I echo both what Hannah and what Eddie said um, in that Black Lives Matter and liberation is the end all be all and that we need to deconstruct colonialism throughout our country and throughout our world. Um, black lives won't matter until black trans lives matter. And that is what I really am focusing on is focusing on deconstructing and decolonizing gender. Because whenever white people moved here in to the United States as part of their imperialism, they created two genders and there were only two genders uh, that were socially acceptable and they were determined at birth. And that's not true. Um, for thousands and thousands of years across cultures, there have been many different genders and it's not determined based off what you're born as, it's based off what you live as and it's based off how you see yourself. And so for me, uh, what I'm focusing on is helping to create health equity around gender issues because it is so very important um, that everybody is free of these constructs that are holding us back, that women have equal treatment to men, that we have equitable treatment across the board um, for all genders. Um, and all variety of people. And that won't be inclusive until we include everyone. And that means including uh, deconstructing issues around race, including deconstructing issues around ability 
and disability and making sure that everything is accessible to everyone. Uh, so right now what I'm working on is healthcare policy uh, to make it so that we can be as inclusive as, as possible and raise up everybody that is currently being pushed down. Black trans lives do matter. Charlie, thank you so much for your powerful call to action on intersectional justice. So grateful for all of you for sharing. So next, I'm really curious. We talked a little bit about issues that we're passionate about, but I'd actually love to hear from you. You know, being an activist is not really always an easy thing. You know, people don't always respond to activists and activisms in the same way. So I'm curious if you could just talk to our audience today and tell us what makes you proud to be an activist? Thank you for that question, Cameron. And I think personally for me, what makes me proud to be an activist is understanding that it's not a title you can necessarily give yourself. So while I appreciate the question, it's something even personally, like I'm not comfortable calling myself an activist because I have very strong feelings that it is something you really, you really cannot put on a resume. You can't walk in and be like, I'm an activist, here's a sticker. Um, it is something earned and it is something through continuous action. So what honestly makes me proud to participate in activism, to participate in movement building is that continuous um, and long-term commitment. Very few things require, uh, let me, I guess very few things um, do we want to stick to as a project or anything long-term if we don't want to see the result come out in at least cyclical output. That's just something that I've noticed. And I think it's something that is really driven in like Western cultures or individualistic cultures. We want to see cyclical output. The thing is about movement building, there is no cyclical output. It's a long-term goal and it's a long-term building that you may not see necessarily um, the end result. But that's kind of what makes me proud to be a part of it is understanding like where is my true commit to my true commitment to my work? Am I willing to stick around and be a part of it even though I will never see the result of my labor or anything? And I guess that kind of makes me proud to participate in it because it reaffirms my values like yes I am, I'm here for the long haul, I'm here because I want better. Um, so that's kind of why it makes me proud to personally be able to participate in that. Anna, thank you. Your, your words remind me of uh, this quote I just love from uh, Jennifer Granholm, who said, sometimes leadership is planting trees under whose shade you'll never sit. Thank you for that reminder. Charlie. Thank you, Cameron. One of my favorite quotes is that every breath a trans person takes is an act of revolution. So keep breathing. And in this country, in this day and age, you can't be a transgender person without having your life politicized in some way. I see transgender all across the news and uh, it's one of those things where just living my life as a transgender person is both something to be proud of and something that is pushing the line uh, for so many different people. And um, for me, what makes me proud is you know, that flag right there, that transgender flag makes me proud. Something else that makes me proud is that um, I am still getting out and still doing things in spite of having fibromyalgia and in spite of having chronic fatigue. And that I've found many different ways to find access and foster access. And so I'm also proud to call myself disabled. Charlie. Thank you for breathing. Thank you for living your life with radical love. Appreciate it. Eddie, how are you proud and being an activist? Well, thank you for, for the question, Cameron. More than anything, I think that activism has given me the gift of being able to stand before people and utilize my voice that I recognize is a privilege that I have for being able to use my voice. There are many people who have been silenced across history. There have been many people 
who have been shut down but i have the privilege to be able to to, to speak my my vo my voice and to be to speak my mind and um to organize in our community like hannah i wouldn't necessarily call myself an activist i prefer the term community organizer um but i think one of the the things that I'm most proud of in working in this field has been to be able to stand before people and proudly say that I'm an undocumented student and more specifically that I say to say that I'm queer. Eddie, thank you so much. Uh, you have so much power in your voice and power in your presence and i thank you all for reminding us the pride in being who we are and that is so much of what activism is it is resisting this idea of status quo that you must look and sound and be one way in order to be worthy uh, you all are walking living pride thank you so we've talked a little bit about the pride of activism but uh, it's not easy work all the time. It can be challenging, uh, especially during the times that we are in right now in this world. So, you know, you've talked a little bit about your lives being an act of resistance, but tell us what is it like to do this activist work when you are experiencing these issues day to day? I think continuing to do this work while facing these issues yourself can serve in twofold as a driver to continue. And I think it's okay and we have to admit it can be, it can wear you down over time. And I think that's fine. I think it's um, not realistic for us to seek comfort or anything and seeing it that we have to be driven by, by the hate we receive or by the hate that we see about who we are. I'm not driven by it. Um, it's there and it exists and sometimes it, you know, that sets me at a bigger flame or something like that, you know, in terms of my passion. But I think regardless of whether it's there or not, I'm going to continue moving forward. I agree with Henna and that it can be both a driver for um, trying to make change happen and it can also be a challenge as well. Something that I found in encountering challenges throughout my life is that I've had to grow in order to overcome them. And so for me, I look at all of these, these challenges that I face as ways to grow my community, ways to grow my connections, and ways for us all to grow ourselves up and make ourselves better. And so when it comes to facing day-to-day -day issues of transphobia or day-to-day -day issues of ableism, um, it, it can be really difficult. And in those moments, it's always okay to remember that you need self-care and you need to pace yourself and that you can't make everything change all at once. You have to have the patience of a thousand years and the urgency of tomorrow. How are you so wise? Mm -mm -mm. You've been I'm stealing these quotes. <laughs> a lot of them aren't mine. I'm just amplifying. <laughs> that is amazing. But yes, uh, it is our collective wisdom that's going to get us there. So keep sharing. Eddie, hey. Well, that, it's a great question, Cameron, because I think that I, we all know the oppression that we live under. Um, but I think that something that always gives me hope is knowing that there are other people that are willing to stand with me to continue to fight and continue to you know, plead so that there's so that there could be a change um but more importantly as you know hannah hannah was saying this is a, a driver to continue to, to work in this field uh and to never give up for the reason that we will be oppressed until the day that we unify and we work together to end all forms of oppression. Uh, and that starts with ourselves. And if I don't wake up 
tomorrow and continue to fight forward, there will be somebody there who will. But strength comes, you know, with unity. And that is really the only way that, that I see that we can continue to you know, move forward is by continuing to fight, fight the system. Unity is strength. Thank you all so much for sharing. So as we all know, this is the topic of the ages and that's 2020. 2020 was a year. Tell us, what did you learn about social justice? Or what do, maybe what do you think America or the world learned about social justice in the past year? Well, Cameron, I think I'll take a stab at this question um, because I think that the United States finally, at least for the vast majority of the, of the country, they did, the veil has been removed. They didn't do it on their own. It was forcefully removed from them. And I think they, what people witnessed over the course of 2020 was the cry for help that people have been, you know, shouting for many, many years. You know, the oppression dates back, you know, to the founding, even before the founding of, of this country. And so I think that that's what it brought. It, it, it removed the veil and it has shown people the struggles and frankly, just the oppression that people have gone through for so many years. And I think that they can finally have some kind of sympathy for the movement. And I, and I think it activated a lot of people into wanting to do more, wanting to participate. The protests that I saw this last summer in Portland were unlike anything I had seen in a long time. And I think that the diversity of the crowds really, really showed the diversity that exists within our community and maybe not within Portland on its own um, because Portland is considered the widest city in the nation. But I think that neighboring communities uh, who also came and supported uh, your know, black lives and um, really showed up for, for, for the people this time. Eddie, thank you. Um, it is true. Uh, one of the defining facts about 2020 was that you could not look away. This is, there was nothing new about this moment. This was not the first time that we heard, I can't breathe even. There was nothing new but we couldn't look away. Thank you for sharing. Charlie, what do you think we've learned? This year, I think we've learned that health equity affects everyone. We've seen that black and brown people have been more adversely affected by the coronavirus and have come down with COVID-19 and that that has had an impact on everyone not just on those communities, but everyone in this country. And that is something that is so important that I think we realize because we all can't have health until the most marginalized of us have health. Healthcare is a human right and healthcare is about the access to life. And so that's something that I think we realized this year and like Eddie said, the veils were just removed on so many different things. And so when it comes to racism in healthcare, when it comes to uh, transphobia, when it comes to anti-immigrant rhetoric in healthcare, this year was the year. Charlie, thank you so much. Yes, health equity, all of us are impacted by these crises and when we don't do anything, all of us are in danger. So thank you so much for sharing. Thank you for the reminder. Henna, take us home. Yeah, I think what people learn about social justice, especially in the US this year, um, is that we can't continue this way that we've been operating since 
I think since the conception of, well, a lot of, you know, the U.S. and white supremacy that's existed far beyond the U.S., but I think that's what it showed. And this is not something new to, I think, the folks who have forever been impacted by this globally, Black folks, Indigenous folks, immigrants, refugees, they've known this forever, that we can't continue. But I think it became aware to, I think, like Eddie said, the vast majority who lived often in ignorance who now see like okay this system isn't working it hasn't been working since it was created that was kind of the point it's not working for us it's not intended to so i think what we what i hopefully um what i hope we all took away from this is that our efforts for change need to go much deeper than what we have settled for and that we don't have a timeline anymore to continue settling for the sake of our planet and for the sake of a lot of our cultures and for the sake of future generations and their own health and their own mental health and the traumas they could experience if we don't put a stop to what has grown in terms of monopoly capitalism in terms of climate destruction in terms of transphobia homophobia xenophobia we have really entered a period where we're completely siloed and kind of sanctioned off and if we continue this way there is no future generations and whatever we're continuing to build right now then we need to seriously re-examine who is it going to last for Twinkle fingers, look at that. Thank you, Henna. So I appreciate you all for sharing. And you know, you know, this might be a hard question, but I think you all are right. You know, we have some big challenges in the world, and we've all learned so much, uh, and that's opened our eyes. But now you can see it's 2021, and things in many ways have gotten worse before they've gotten better. And it seems that even though we've learned so much, it is still almost impossible. It is still really hard to see the type of changes that we need to see in our communities. Can you tell us, what do you think is happening? Why do you think even with everything that we've learned, everything that we couldn't turn our eyes away from, we are still struggling to make even the smallest change? Thank you for that question, Cameron. I think why we are still at a place where we're not seeing change even after a year of going through one of the most explicit i think years possible um in terms of failing systems is because we're not identifying the root of the issue and i think we're continuing to see problems emerge and we keep skirting away from talking about what's really causing this well cameron i think that one of the reasons why and and i wouldn't say we have failed in affecting long-lasting change um because there is no failure in trying. We have done our part to continue to, in many ways, alleviate the stressors that, you know, that are placed on, on people who are oppressed. Um, but I think that when we go out there and voice our, you know, our opinions and voice our concerns, our elected officials or people in leadership positions keep putting what we call a band-aid approach a temporary solution that is just that it's temporary right for example daca right i'm a daca student i'm, I'm documented but daca is really just a, a band-aid it's a temporary solution that was um you know signed by the obama administration as an executive action but it's it's temporary it it leaves us in, you know, in a limbo where I, I don't know if I'm safe, you know, one administration to the next. I just experienced the most horrific four years of my life under, you know, the last administration. And uh, I think that beyond that, our elected officials need to pony up and enact through policy, you know, changes that are long lasting that will come for generations. Thank you for sharing. It, I know it is hard to talk about the challenges that you've been through, but I appreciate you for, for being vulnerable here with this audience. Charlie, care to share? I think the reason that we haven't made as much progress as we should from 2020 to 2021 
just goes to demonstrate how deep-seated colonialism and white supremacy are in this country. And it is, we need a, a sea change um, in order for this to happen. And we started to see that in 2020, but the wave is still going. And we still have all of these activists and community organizers that are here in this panel today who are pushing for change. And that is what is actually going to affect change is all of us continuing to work together and to enact new legislation and new social policy so that we can all have an equitable and future together. Could not have said that better myself. For those who are watching, you heard it straight from Charlie. We need a sea change. So I hope that you are feeling like water. Henna would love to bring you back in. Thank you, yes. Um, to answer that question, I think um, why we haven't seen any changes is because we are not talking about the root of the issue. So we keep bringing up the situation, whether it's coronavirus, whether it's the high un unemployment that took place, or whether it's the clear deterrence to keep investing into a bloated military budget than the people on, you know, that live in this country and to consistently prioritize basically browning, uh, bombing brown and black people globally than actually taking care of people here. Um, I think it's because the we keep, our attention keeps getting diverted away. We're not coming together and we're not talking about what's actually going on here. Our attention keeps getting diverted and we continue to let it be. And I think it's often because we also don't think long-term of how these will take effect and will take place, you know, for the rest of our lives. We're very concerned with the short term. So I think it is time we really think long term. So I think often in indigenous practice, it's seven generational thinking. How is this going to impact seven generations down the line? And for us to talk about, okay, what is what is really causing, you know, um, the, the public health crisis of people not being able to get vaccinated, the privatization of healthcare, People don't have easy access to healthcare. You know, there's in what at the root of that, why do we have the privatization? So it's really about we need to concretely think and whether it's going down and thinking event event, what is going on? How did this come out? You know, where did this issue arise from? Then we're never really going to treat it. And this will continue well into 2022, 2023. And then we're going to keep having the same question of how did this rise up in 2022? It's because we didn't learn a lesson in 2021. This will be a perpetuating cycle. And it very much is in our hands today, right now, if we were just to stand up and say, this is enough and we can do better and let's not repeat these mistakes then we will continuously be stalled. But unfortunately, I think the vast majority of folks who are, I think often settlers are not ready to move in that direction. So that's why we continue finding ourselves stuck, stuck in the same issues. So I think um, that is why we're gonna see 2021 most likely go a lot like 2020 until we see a serious shift and we need to do the work for this to change. Wow. I just have to say, y'all are giving me goosebumps right now. Thank you so much for everything that you are sharing. Just wow. Thank you. So, you know, we've talked about how we are still not getting it. This is hard times. And it's so easy seeing how little action is happening to fall into despair. So I'm wondering what makes you most hopeful for our collective future? Well, Cameron, you know, I, I mentioned this earlier, but I think that for me, what makes me most hopeful is knowing that people like you and our counterparts here with us will continue to work together to affect substantive change. And knowing that there is allyship between us because we are in a melting pot of intersectionality and only by working together can we achieve great things. And so I'm, I'm most hopeful about our unity 
and about our intersectionality and about the ways in which we can collaborate together to affect that change we want to see. So really it's, it's that it's, it's knowing that people like you all will back me up and knowing that I will back y'all up when that time comes. Eddie, thanks for sharing that. And I actually have a follow-up question for you. Um, you've talked about unity a couple of times, but you know we're living in a time where this United States is not very united. Could you maybe tell us, maybe like some kind of tool or skill that you've learned when it's come to building unity? Yeah, no, I think that's a great question. Um, because I think that one of the biggest problems we have in this country is the lack of intercultural tolerance or just, or just tolerance in general. And a, a lot of the work that I have done is incorporating ethnic studies uh, and incorporating them into the uh, social studies curriculum. We've achieved that in Oregon. Oregon recently became the, um, the one and only state in the nation to incorporate an ethnic studies program. And that resulted from, from a campaign that I had the privilege to work on and and the, the primary goal was to create that, you know, to build tolerance, create tolerance, um, and also to just, you know, radically reform the way that we approach education from a pedagogical standpoint um, and teaching, you know, kids of other ethnicities about each other. Because that's the only way that we can learn about our struggles, about the, the struggles of other people. So, um to me, that's 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 how we do it. That's how we build unity in, in creating some common understanding, some common ground. Eddie, that was powerful. Thank you. It reminds me of a quote from proud black trans author and activist Janet Mock, who said that telling our stories first to ourselves, then to one another, and then to the world, it is a radical act. So thank you for that. Um, who else is feeling hopeful? I am hopeful in the next generation. Uh, the ones who are coming of age in this time as they are witnessing what all of us have been witnessing for the last year and a half. And the next generation, Generation Z, uh, it was incredible to see them out on the front lines of Black Lives Matter protests this summer. And it has been incredible to see the way that they have adapted and built themselves up as much as they can during this time of unprecedented strife. So I am so hopeful that the next generation is going to be right there with all of us as we build a better tomorrow. Charlie, thank you so much. And thank you, yes, to our, you know, I thought I was the youth. I remember just a couple of years ago how I was the youth. And now we got all these little skinny short kids over here in the streets to get all the attention. But as you said, Charlie, yes, uh, we are in it together and I'm getting tired. You know, my back is not as strong as it used to. So huge shout out to our young people who have been out there without asking for permission, without waiting for someone else to take initiative, who are going out there and being the change. Henna. Yeah, I think what makes me hopeful for our collective future, honestly, is going to be the telling of stories. I think in the passing down of those, I think that's the only thing that is stronger than what a lot of these oppressive systems are meant to do, which is to erase and to forget. But what they have mistaken is you can't erase oral story storytelling. You can't erase passing down, you know, tales from your family to your children or with your family and your community. That is something they don't have power over. And so that's what I'm very strong in. I'm a huge writer. I very much love writing. Um, and I'm very strong in, in that act of whether it's poetry or whether it's sitting down for coffee or tea. It doesn't have to be anything formal. It's just the sharing of our stories from one culture to another or with, for from one parent to a child because I think that's gonna. That's what makes me hopeful that they're going to carry on a lot of the resistance that has been here. That is, I think that we've especially seen, at least in my time. I'm 22, you know, so I've experienced what I've only experienced. Um, but to be able to take down kind of the teachings and the teachings of those struggles, and to be able to carry them on in their own fights um, against these oppressive systems. 
Hannah, thank you. Follow up question. What is your story that the world needs to hear? Yeah, my story. Um, I appreciate the platform. Honestly, my story is I'm Muslim, I'm Palestinian, I'm an anti-imperialist and I'm anti-colonialist. And my fight is really for the liberation of my country and the liberation of my people. And in understanding that growing up, I realized that cannot come, it doesn't come alone in a vacuum nor in a silo. The, the liberation of Palestine will never be free by itself. It also has to come with indigenous sovereignty and black liberation globally. It doesn't exist in silo. And so that's honestly why I became so driven to whatever I do, whatever work I end up doing, I want it to be the ultimate it will contribute to the collective liberation. So, so that's why for, in, and I do it in whatever spaces I'm able to be in and occupy. So a lot of my story is I'll, I'll be an annoying and a resistance force, a resistant force. You'll notice me wherever I'm in, you'll notice me and I'll have something to complain about, but I'll be there. <laughs> Hannah, thank you so much for telling your story. And I appreciate hearing that your story is filled of love, self-love and hope. So, uh, you know, next question, let's keep talking about ourselves and maybe let's let lean a little more de deeply and intently into our own personal stories. And this last year has been full of learning. What is one thing that you've learned about yourself in this past year? Well, Cameron, this year I have learned that together with other members of my community, we can keep each other safe. Um, I set out uh, to organize an event around the Transgender Day of Remembrance, which for those who aren't familiar, uh, the Transgender Day of Remembrance is a day where we honor and remember our dead, specifically dead transgender folks who were murdered. Um, and a majority of those folks um, were Black people or people of color. Um, but there were a diversity of different people who in this past year we have lost. And one person that wasn't murdered per se, but um, I think through negligence and inaction um, came about to you know, lose her life was Lorena Borjas. And she died at 59 in Brooklyn, New York, and, uh, or maybe it was Queens. Lorena Borjas uh, was an immigrant activist, and in the 90s, she couldn't access um, any HIV testing as a transgender um, Mexican woman. And so what she did is she wound up creating a testing clinic in her own home. And from there, she was able to organize and continue building within her community. And so this year, what I've learned is that if you interact with your community, you can build amazing things to help each other. And so around Transgender Day of Remembrance in honor of Lorena, um, I set about to have a COVID testing event specifically for queer and trans folks. And it was incredible to see how so many different organizations came together to serve our community. Uh, there were food boxes from Esther's Pantry. Uh, there were um, health resources from Kaiser, OHSU, uh, Quest Center, Cascadia Behavioral Health. All of these community allies uh, were involved with this. And it was amazing to see retired healthcare workers volunteering alongside anarchist activists at the same time. And so uh, together we were able to help contain the spread of COVID-19 and keep each other safe. So that's what I learned this year is that together we can keep each other safe. Charlie, thank you. And in honor and memory of Lorena and all of the trans people who we've lost to violence and unresolved injustice, I just want to take a, a moment of silence in remembrance of them. Uh, 
uh, Henna or e Eddie. Uh, what have you learned about yourself? What have I learned about myself? I think I learned to stop being performative in a very interesting way. I didn't realize how, many, how much of our interactions every day or our processes every day were very arbitrary and that life was actually very efficient whether or not we do them. And so I think I just learned that there's no need to engage in them if there isn't a purpose to it. It's better just to live without these weird professional standards in my opinion. And so that's, I think how I started honestly being and I realized how less tiring it is when you're not necessarily always trying to adhere to these white supremacy standards of how to be and how to act and speak and, and how to engage with people. Um, and then, so I think it just, it became easier to live. I think that's what I learned about myself is that I could be formative. And so I learned, I want it, I want it to be easier to live. Thank you, Hannah. Eddie. Well, that's a, it's a tricky question uh, because I hate talking about myself. Um, but I think uh, one of the greatest lessons this year for me uh, as an individual has been to, to never or to at least stop underestimating myself. And I say that as an immigrant, as a queer person, uh, as um, an undocumented student or a documented student, um, you know, navigating white spaces, specifically, at, you know, here at, at the university where I've transferred to, um, where, you know, there is, it's vastly white dominated space and learning to, um, to, to step away from what is commonly referred to as imposter syndrome, right? And, and knowing that I belong here and that I've worked hard to get here. Um, and uh, so, so it really is encompassing of that, uh, of, you know, stopping that underestimation that I've always, you know, kind of had about myself. Eddie, thank you. Um, so here we are at an event for and with PCC. So I'm curious if y'all could tell me a little bit about what role PCC has played in your journey so far. I think um, the journey, you know, or the way that PCC helped to personally in my journey was um, I got introduced to a lot of amazing people personally, students like myself, who are now alumni um, was one of the most effective ways that I think one of the, actually the best ways I grew personally because meeting those people, I think they shaped a lot of who I am now. And I, a lot of them was I met during this political internship um, when I, that I did through Portland Community College. And I would say, you know, it was my first time doing any kind of extracurricular activity. I typically stayed away from doing anything extra outside of what was required of school. Um, so that internship was kind of a first thing for me, and I think it really set to a different course for the rest of my life. And through many ways, I mean, I think P Portland Community College was my first experience kind of going out into the world and really interacting with it and understanding what it means to find people and to build with them for better. And in this case, in a lot of situations, it was for the better of PCC students. Um, and so, yeah, that's kind of what I think on that. Thank you, Hannah. Eddie, hey. Well, thank you for that question, Cameron. Um, for me, uh, as a documented student, um, you know, go, exiting high school, uh, I had really had no option. I didn't know about scholarships uh, that would be available to me. And at that time, there really weren't any. Um, so when I thought about my dreams and my, you know, in terms of, you know, my educational goals, I had one option and that was to go to PCC and at continue um, my way there. And I remember I had a counselor who, who helped me at my high school uh, it, with enrolling into PCC, but also registering for a scholarship from PCC called Future Connect, which is a scholarship for low-income first-generation students. And it was through Future Connect that I, that I was able to connect with other groups. Um, and then eventually, you know, going throughout the years as I, as I was with PCC, 
working uh, to establish the, the Dreamers Gala and the Dreamers Resource Center at Rock Creek. Um, however, at that point, there wasn't really a lot of investment into those programs, into those events. And so in uh, 2017, we launched a, a similar campaign like we did in the state educational system. We asked the PCC board to adopt an ethnic studies department and um, the board agreed uh, and it, it got it got enacted. Right. But a part of our request was to ask for permanent funding for the Dreamers Resource Center. And I think that that is what I'm, you know, the, the where PCC and the impact that it's had on me uh, is to know that I was able to help, you know, future or other uh, undocumented and documented students um, who will benefit from from having access to that center. And so all around, um, it was just developing myself as a leader and uh, developing those skills that I that I would eventually come to use um, out in the community. Wow, Eddie, that is incredible. I honestly can't say much for myself. Like the proudest thing I did at uh, uh, PCC was passing my creative writing class. So it is amazing to hear the huge difference that you made, not just for your own learning, uh, but so that every undocumented student at PCC is able to be seen and is able to thrive. So thank you so much. Charlie. For me, PCC has meant an accessible place for me to learn. Um, this year, I was working overnight as a CNA, and I can't think of any other college where I would have been able to do overnights and then go into class the next morning and still have such amazing support from other students and from the faculty there. And this year I developed my fibromyalgia and chronic fatigue as well. And um, I can't think of a more accessible place for me to have been diagnosed with those disabilities than uh, Portland Community College. All of my professors and instructors have been just so wonderful around my disabilities, around my gender identity. And so it's it's been a really accessible place for me to learn and it's been a place that I, I feel like it's home. Place that feels like home. Thank you, Charlie. Um, thank you for sharing such amazing, powerful words about PCC, our home. So how do you see PCC showing up and advancing the cause of social justice? Or how do you want it? How do you want to see them show up for social justice? I think personally for me, it's realizing what PCC's impact can be on the students that attend, but also its greater impact kind of in the Portland and global community. So I think um, in terms of advancing towards the causes of social justice, again, it's really looking at the roots of issues. Why, why are students, you know, financially insecure when going to college? Why are students food insecure? Um, I think often it's, it's we keep throwing a lot of money at the problem and it's sometimes right in front of us in terms of what we can do systemically, um, I, th I think, for these issues. So in regards, you know, into tuition, of course, as a student, it's, it's tuition free. And of course, that's not something Portland Community College could do on its own. But it has a place in Portland, it has a place in our government, it has a place to create power. So I think that's what these institutions can do. It's realizing their impact. It's, it's realizing who are we partnering with and funneling our students to? Are we putting them through systems of where they're going to continue to perpetuate violence or are they be putting them in systems where they're gonna actually create and contribute to the collective good of our communities? So I think that's what um, institutions like Portland Community College can continue doing to advance towards social justice. Well, Cameron, personally, I have to say that PCC needs to continue to make monetary investments in scholarships specific for communities that are underrepresented, right? Um, and aside from that, you know, just in general, that I would say, you know, put your money where your mouth is, I have seen 
a specific director from the from the PCC board of directors show up this summer at the protests. So shout out to you, Michael, uh, for being there. I saw you multiple times, and I think that that is where you know true leadership you know comes from. Um, and Michael has been very supportive to to us uh, as undocumented students in the past, um, but in general. Um, for all students. And I think that if, if more people, more leaders show up, leaders around them will take notice and they will act in a similar way uh, and or contribute to, to the causes that, that we're fighting. For example, the causes that you're leading at Cameron. So uh, yeah, people need to, you know, open up those wallets and, uh, you know, support, support students, support, um, local nonprofits, uh, support local efforts uh, so that people have access to, to education at PCC. Eddie, I love it. You just gave a shout out to PCC school board member who also happens to be my PCC poli sci teacher, Professor Michael Sonleitner. So huge shout out to our PCC leadership uh, who for a long time, I've known uh, Mr. Sonleitner for many, many years, and I've known how long he's truly been in support of the Black Lives Matter cause, both before and today. So keep it up. <laughs> Charlie. I see PCC advancing social justice in ways of keeping the campus as open and as accessible as possible. Um, and having that commitment to diversity now and in the future. And what that means is both financially, it also means speaking out whenever these uh, issues come to light in our society and letting students know that this is where we stand and this is why. And so going forward, what that means is that we need to continue to remodel and rebuild our campuses to make them more accessible to students with disabilities. It also means that we need to make our campuses as financially accessible to as many students as possible, because education is what causes equity for us all. Uh, we all need to understand the world around us and have a, a greater understanding of our communities in order for us to affect change. And that's only going to happen if we have access. Charlie, thank you. And I want to give out a shout out to you, Charlie, to you, Eddie, to you, Henna. This has been an absolutely incredible hour together. This has been a riveting conversation that has helped my heart sing and reminding me that we are in this together and I'm so hopeful to see what we can have happen when we work together. So I just have one final question for you all uh, before we wrap this up. And for the audience that's listening right now, you know, what is your call to action? How can people who are listening right now be showing up for social justice? Thank you for that question, Cameron. I think my call to action to the community is understanding that committing change towards social justice is not a hat you can partially wear on and off. It is evaluating and reflecting on all your surroundings and all your positionalities and understanding where can you target the issue, the root of the issue, wherever it takes root, right? That's kind of the focus. There is no singular kind of bucket of where if you kick that over, it's going to resolve everything or whatever, you know, it's going to take white supremacy in itself as a culture takes root everywhere. So it's about what can I seek out? Where can I root it out? And where can I truly affect change? Um, it's about understanding what you're talking about. So honestly, it's reading about anti-racism, but understanding it not within arbitrary colonial borders. It's going past that. It's reading about prison abolition. It's actually reading about how different, how the gender binary house created by white supremacy. It is It is talking about how, for, for example, Ari, you know, for how, immigration how honestly a lot of indigenous people here to these lands were displaced and now considered undocumented even though this was the original lands they inhabited even though the u.s destabilizes other countries and creates refugee ship so it's really about understanding 
the historical context of where you are, especially, especially with your positionality and kind of this settler occupying state. And it's understanding where can I take an effect change in every space that I'm in, not just on the weekends or not just on the evenings. Hannah, thank you. Eddie, what's your call to action? So Cameron, I, I will just have to say to folks watching is to uh, recognize your own privilege and to to not you know impose onto other people to uh, to tell you what you need to do. It starts with you, right? I'm not going to tell you how to act or how to show up. It really has to come from within your own heart so that you can affect your change. And as I said earlier, in doing so, recognize the privileges that you carry so that you aren't displacing other voices. And so that I think really, Cameron, it, it ends there for me. Thank you, Eddie. Charlie, take us home. So Cameron, to our audience, I would say the best way uh, that they can affect change is to show up. You've got to show up with your dollars, you've got to show up with your body, and you've got to show up with your mind. So showing up with your dollars is important because unfortunately, we live in a capitalist society. And until we get rid of that as part of white supremacy, you got to show up with your dollars, show up with your body doesn't matter how your body shows up, it could be virtually, it could be in person out on the front lines, it could be just day to day in your work, whenever you are rooting out white supremacy and colonialism in your day to day life, and then show up with your mind. So come to all of these spaces with the mind to learn, the mind to share your stories, the mind to listen to other people, and to make space for them as well. Because if you do those three things, we can have a better future with more equity and positive change. Wow. Y'all, I, I have no words. I have no words. This is just another special moment that serves a reminder that none of us are in this alone. And it is a combination of our stories woven together like a tapestry. That is strength. It is that resilience of these stories, these perspectives weaving together. Y'all just wove together an incredible tapestry of change tonight. It is an honor to be here in your orbit, even if it is just on Zoom. Um, thank you for being part of this Portland community. I can't wait to see the other ways that your stars are going to shine in this community. I'm so grateful for this time we had together. Cameron, so for me, I know we haven't actually met in person as far as I know, um, but I first uh, came to see you out there with our community in 2019 whenever there were attacks around town on visibly queer folks and you were the director of the Q Center. And for me, that was a pivotal moment in terms of my um, involvement with my community um, was to see all of the various folks around town come together to offer safe rides, uh, to offer um, just expressions of caring and safety for everyone in our community together. And so I wanted to ask you what that moment was like when you were running that town hall. And then how did that help you in the future with your work with Black Resilience Fund um, and all of the other amazing work you do, Cameron? Charlie, thank you for that question. Um, that weekend was more powerful than words can describe for me. Our community was not ready. That week, we just had string after string after string of these stories of community members, people even 
under the age of 18 who were coming to us, going to the media. We're hearing it on social media as well. It was on Facebook, it was on Twitter. All over the place, we were hearing these stories. There were over a dozen attacks, physical attacks, against LGBTQ members of our community. You know, the most horrendous was of a trans woman who was leaving Crush Bar, one of our few LGBTQ plus establishments, walking down the street in Southeast, inner Southeast Portland, and was later found uh, beaten several times in the head uh, and taken to the hospital without the police ever actually trying to investigate what could have happened to her. She lost so much from that. She was a, a pilot. You know, she was an educator and she was permanently damaged because of that attack. And the police did not take it seriously. That was a hard week for so many in our communities and they came to turn to the Q Center. That was also a hard week for me as well. I remember in my own life, I was dealing with some serious challenges and I just remember that weekend, you know, at Q Center already like dealing with my own stuff and I just remembered, we have a town hall we have to do in a couple of hours. I'm gonna put aside whatever I'm dealing with and I need to show up for the community right now. And a huge shout out to the community, the army that came together that weekend. We, it wasn't just Q Center. We partnered with all of our LGBTQ plus sibling organizations and allies. We had Pride Northwest, Basic Rights Oregon, Utopia, serving our LGBTQ API community. We had SAGE, we had Portland United Against Hate, and so many others who banded together. Shout out to PICA, because at first we were supposed to have our event at the Q Center. And, you know, within the hours of us setting that uh, event live on social media, we had more RSVPs than we had space for. And it was the Portland Institute for Contemporary Art who said, don't worry about it. We have the space, don't worry about the money. And together we held within the matter of days, a rally for our community. And it was in that space that I was reminded that we are here to take care of each other. It was one of the most accessible events that I had ever seen happen before in Portland. And we planned that in just a handful of days. We had ASL interpretation. We had people out in the community doing patrols and walking people to and from their cars. Uh, we had Lyft, rideshare company, donate free rides so no one had to take public transit or be unsafe getting there. We had food, we had gender neutral restrooms, we had acupuncture, we had therapy. It was such an amazingly accessible event. And we did that during a time when our community was hurting and our community had uncertainty. So I think a lot about that moment and it reminded me to this day, even with COVID, even with the wildfires, even with the upright uproar, the justified uproar due to the loss of too many black lives. It's sent me a reminder that our community is here and we are willing to fight. I do believe that the defining moments of 2020 is a reminder that any one of us, whether we are a first responder, whether we are a protester or a voter, that any one of us can be a hero in waiting. Thank you for your question. Thank you, Cameron. That was so powerful. Cameron, um, well, thank you for, for giving us the opportunity to ask you some questions. I, um, you asked us this question earlier, um, and I, I just, I, I'm curious to know what does it mean to you as a black and queer activist to engage in the whitest city in America? And well, let me rephrase that, in the whitest city in the United States. Um, so what does that mean to you? What does it mean for you to, to be doing the work that you do in that context and in this environment? Thank you, Eddie. And I see you like revenge. <laughs> this is what I get for asking y'all too many questions. Um, my Portland story is an interesting one, as I think all of ours are. And, you know, I came here at the age of 18. I 
did not know anything about Oregon's history at this time. All I really knew was, you know, we had that Oregon Trail game growing up. So I knew that this is where Jackie died of dysentery. That is all I really knew about Oregon. But uh, my first, my very first day was a rude awakening about the ugly side of Oregon that we don't always talk about. So I was 18 years old and I had hitched a ride with a friend and we stayed for one night at his dad's house, which was in Albany. So about an hour and a half outside of Portland. And after staying that one night at my friend's dad's house, the dad asked us to leave because he was uncomfortable having a black man in his house. I honestly did not see that coming. I am just this young kid from suburban Northern Virginia. I never could have expected to be here in Oregon and to see somebody look at me in the color of my skin and deny me something as essential as housing. Because of that man, because of the hatred that he had for me, I became homeless. I came to Portland and I became homeless. I had nowhere to go, I had no one to turn to. And it was in those shelters, surrounded by dozens of my peers, people who were my age, 17 to 24, and who were honestly too young to have made any mistakes that had justified them being living here in a shelter and have nowhere else to go. Many of my peers there were LGBTQ. Many of my peers there were black. That shelter was blacker and gayer than the city as a whole. And it was a rude awakening of what I might expect coming into adulthood. My journey with Portland has been rocky. You know, I've lived here now for 12 years. And I, like many people, have come to this realization that yes, Portland and Oregon now have a progressive history. Now you see us, you know, getting TV shows and the New York Times talking about how we are hippies who ride goats and drink kombucha. But that's just part of our story. And after having lived here for more than a decade, there have been times of, um, in my Portland journey where I've come to realize that this place where I've planted my roots, these roots have been planted in poison soil. That's been a hard realization to make, to realize that this place that you call home can hurt you. But at the same time, despite knowing that I will walk out the door and know that there might be someone, there will be someone who will see me as different, other, and less. I have also, in the last 12 years, have found community here. And I'm saying to you, Eddie, and Charlie, and Hannah, that I, as a queer, black, formerly houseless kid, I found community and I found healing here. It's because I, know I deserve love and knowing that I can build real authentic relationships that I can have everything that I deserve and I can live my best life. It has not been easy, but it's been so worth it. And so as a part of this journey of healing and of community, it is now my calling to ensure that every single one of us in Portland and in every corner of this country and all countries has that same opportunity. Wow, Cameron, uh, I'm I'm frankly speechless. Uh, thank you for for sharing that 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 impactful story, uh, and that's your story. Um, so I want to commend you for your resilience in in coming out of, of that other side well. And um, and uh, it reminded me of a, a quote um, that is used in. Uh, my home country of Mexico, um, and uh, you might know it, um, and it goes, uh, they try to bury us, but they didn't know we were seeds. And um, yeah, I think that, that that's a Portland experience for a lot of us, but um, you know, you mentioned being planted in poisonous soil, um, but even with that, you know, we're flourishing. And so I commend you for your work, and I commend everybody else for the work that, that uh, you're doing. It's wonderful stuff. Thank you for sharing. Thank you, Eddie. Wow. 
Eddie, Charlie, and Henna. I just gotta say thank you all for this precious time that we just had together. I've learned so much, as I'm sure we all who are watching have learned from you. And it is true inspiration for the change that we can create together. So I wanna give a shout out to this treasured institution that is the thread that has brought us together, and that is our Portland Community College. Thank you for being such a powerful part of our lives and for bringing us together for this important conversation. So together, let us continue to learn and continue to turn our love into action.